Okay, so welcome to Archaeologia Informatica. Tonight, as promised, we have a very special guest. In this episode, we have the pleasure to be discussing with Michael Tomczak. Introducing Michael is really a hard task because he has been, and he still is active in many fields. He is and has been an entrepreneur, a manager, a writer, a consultant, a soldier, and many more things. He's a true innovator and a leader in driving change in the teams and companies he works with. Of course, we as computer archeologists will mainly focus on his important and seminal work at Commodore. But in our conversation, we are sure many of his fields of expertise will surface. So first of all, Welcome, Michael, to Archaeologia Informatica. It is a real pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you so much, Roberto and Carlo. It's my pleasure, actually. And thank you to everyone who's uh, watching this video. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great pleasure for us. So I will just jump into some questions uh, that, we, that we prepared. And then we, we can expand to whatever we, we, we like. It were, while we were offline for our viewers and listeners, we were discussing that uh, we do all of this to, of course, research history, but mainly to have fun together. And this is what we are planning to do uh, right now. So, Michael, your beginnings at Commodore. We all read your book, or I hope so, the home computer works. If you don't, if you didn't read Michael's book yet, just do it, please. And uh, your beginnings after the, your service uh, in the United States Army, we have read about your job search and the way you approached and finally joined Commodore, almost by mere chance, I would say. What can you tell us about this period and why eventually you did choose Commodore? Well, you know, they say chance favors the prepared mind, and I think that's true of, in my case. After I earned my MBA at UCLA in Los Angeles, I, I had been a consultant, and my, uh, the head of the consulting firm wanted to close down the firm and retire, and I didn't want to operate a consulting firm. I wanted to manage something. So I went to San Francisco and I, I accepted a job as general manager of a company that did special effects for uh, movies um, like Time After Time and Logan's Run and some classic movies. And we also did special effects and graphics for Atari games. Atari was one of our best clients. One day Atari brought in a prototype of an Atari 800 with a game called Star Raiders. That was one of the first games that had star fields that, uh, that were built into the firmware. So when you travel through the game, the stars went past you and uh, things you were shooting at like enemy starships would come at you from a distance and then approach and get bigger. That was one of the first games that was really real and very addictive. In fact, it was so addictive that my staff wouldn't stop playing the darn game. So I took it home. So. <laughs> Three days later, it's six o'clock in the morning, and I looked up, and I saw a thin shaft of light coming in through the, 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 the living room curtains, and I was on the floor with this computer, and I realized I had been playing that game three days without any sleep. Whenever I came home from work, I played Star Raiders on the Atari prototype machine. I fell in love with computers because I said, if I'm addicted to this, everybody's going to be addicted to home computing. And of course, they had basic the basic uh, programming language built in and a few other things that addicted me. So I, I literally quit my job. I lived on my salary for six months to help pay the rent and, and keep me afloat. <clears throat> I started doing stories on... Uh, accessories for Apple computers like they had a circuit uh, they had a, a plug-in board that converted the Apple from 40 columns to 80 columns so I did a story on that and in order to do that I had to go down to Apple and interview Steve Wozniak and uh, Andy Hertzfeld who was his partner and I met Steve Jobs 
<clears throat> I started hanging out at Apple. And in fact, I was the only guy who could walk into Apple without an ID badge. And I used to walk right by the security guard's desk and they used to yell at me. And I just walked back to Steve Wozniak's cubicle and sit down and they'd be yelling at me like, you need a security badge and all of that. <laughs> I, I'm a lifelong rule breaker. I've always been that. You cannot be an innovator without breaking rules. And when you break rules, that extends into all aspects of your life, certainly at Apple. Uh, one day I, I, I said to um, Jobs and Wozniak, who were standing talking with me, I said, you know, I'm not doing this for my health. I'm looking for a job in the computer industry. And they said, oh, of course, Michael, go in the cafeteria look at the job postings and find something you're qualified for and we'll hire you for that. So I went into the cafeteria <laughs> and I found these, <laughs> this thick sheaf of, of, red, of, of job descriptions on the bulletin board and it looked so formal. And of course they had the guards, the badges, the security, um, the, um, uh, all of the job descriptions, very formal and very sterile. And I said, geez, that's not quite my style. So, I, so then I had heard a lot of things about Commodore because I was taking basic programming and software classes at night at computer stores. And one night we would have a Commodore at PET and the next night we would have an Apple. The reason was they didn't have a, enough computers of one kind to go around. So you never knew which computer you were going to use. So I became accidentally ambidextrous. I could use Apples and Commodores. And I also was a marketing, I, I had been a, a product manager and a, a, a marketing consultant. And my specialty was introducing and launching disruptive technologies, new things and so forth. And that's what I did as a consultant in, uh, in, the, middle, in, in the Midwest. And then in Beverly Hills, when I was going to grad school, I was a consultant there. So I... I called Jack Tramiel's secretary. He's the founder of Commodore, of course. And she arranged an in interview for me. So I walked into Jack's office and I sat down. And Jack, <clears throat> Jack was this short, bald, paunchy, so paunchy he could put his hands in his belt and rest them there. That's how <laughs> big his company was. But he had this deep, booming voice. And he, his voice was so deep he could make the walls shake if he raised his voice. I'm not kidding. <clears throat> and so he just leaned back and looked with me with a kind of amusement. And he said, so what do you know about Commodore? My exact words were, I don't know much about Commodore, but I found out that everybody who knows you personally seems to think that you're some kind of crook. <laughs> but, Good. But, I, but I figure... If you're not in jail or prison, you're not a crook. You're just a shrewd businessman. And I'd like to learn to be shrewd like that. And he looked <laughs> at me. His expression didn't change. So he just looked at me, still amused. And the reason I can remember that little speech, I practiced it 45 minutes in front of a mirror at home. So I could get it right because I was going to go insult the founder of Commodore, <laughs> and but I had nothing to lose because I had a job offer from Jobs and Wozniak. So I just rolled the dice, and Jack said, "What else?" And I said, "There are at least twenty things wrong with your company, and I can help you solve them." And I rattled them right off the top of my head. Really horrible advertising, no PR, bad relations with the user clubs. Your packaging looks like the 1940s. You're, you have the best operating system, but nobody knows it. Uh, <clears throat> you and, and all kinds of things. So I went on and on and on. And he, he looked at me and he said, hmm. He said, if I hired you, I'd have to teach you. And I don't know if I have the luxury of teaching someone the religion. And I said, the, uh, the religion? Like he was Jewish. I said, do I have to become Jewish or what? He said, no, <laughs> religion is the business. I call my business philosophy the religion. And I found out later that the religion is very, very specific. I'll talk about that in a minute. So he said, well, you go, go, uh, let me think about it. I'll uh, call me tomorrow. The next day I called him 11 
times. That's not an exaggeration. 11 times. Every time his secretary screened me out, she said, Jax hasn't decided yet what he's going to do with you. Jax in the <laughs> meeting. He'll call you back after the meeting. Jack went to lunch. He'll call you when he gets back. Jack's in another meeting. Jack's still thinking about it. So seven o'clock at night, this is this is actually what happened. Seven o'clock at night, I called the secretary's number. The phone rang on her desk. Everybody was gone from the company except Jack. He happened to be walking by the desk. He heard the phone ring, and he did this all the time. He used to do this all over the company. He'd walk up to a desk where the phone was ringing and answer it and try to solve the problem himself. So he he said, you have to touch and feel a company like this with his hand. He goes, you have to touch and feel everything. So that's what he was doing. So I said, Jack, it's Michael. And he said, oh, Michael, come on in tomorrow. I know what I'm going to do with you. So I came in the next day, and to make a long story short, he hired me as assistant to the president, and I said, and can we add the title marketing strategist? Because that's what I do. And he said, sure. So I became assistant to the president and marketing strategist. And this was around, around April 1st, 1980, April Fool's Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always thought it was really ironic, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have a say so. <laughs> so, so he said, look, you." I said, so when can I start? Now, by the way, <clears throat> I had dwindled down my um, finances so low that I had $10 in the bank. That's the lowest you can keep on in a, a checking account and $6 cash in my pocket the, the day before. And I wasn't sure if I had enough money to pay for gas to go down to San Francisco, to Silicon Valley and back to San Francisco. So I told um, Evan Locke, who, uh, Robert Locke, who was the um, um, editor of Compute Magazine, can he wire me some money overnight? And he did that. He was really cool. It's the only time in my life I ever used Western Union. So like 10 o'clock at night, I went and got some cash the night before. So that's how broke I was. So <laughs> so I said, Jack, when can I start? Hoping like he'd say tomorrow. And he's he said, well, you can start right away and join me in two days in Europe. There's a big meeting, a planning strategic planning meeting of all the managers of Commodore in London at a place called the Fox and Hounds, which is like a country estate outside of London. And he said, you can join me there or you can start after that. And I said, no, I'll join you in London. I'll join you in London. That's fine. <laughs> so, so, I, yes, and yeah, I got, so I got an advance. Oh, and he, oh then, then he said, oh, you probably want to know about money. He said, what's the lowest amount of money you can live on and be comfortable? So I gave him a price and he said, okay, I'm going to pay you that for six months. And then after six months, we'll make it up to you. I said, okay, that sounds fair. Any amount was good to me because I was broke. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I joined Commodore. And by the way, I must tell you, Steve Jobs never forgave me for that. And I didn't think he valued me that highly because he was always a little bit cold to me at, at Apple. Wozniak was like a buddy. He was, hey, Michael, you know, we were like best. We were like, great. He's Jobs. Uh, Wozniak is like that. Uh, Jobs is very kind of cold. So from then on, whenever I went to a convention or a conference and I went up to say, I, I walk up and say, hi, Steve. And I start talking to him. He would ignore me as if I didn't <laughs> exist. He would literally look past me. And and Bill Gates, on the other hand, was friendly. He was jovial. I knew Bill Gates really well. We we licensed his um, his uh, operating system, and I and I knew Waz, and I stayed in touch with a lot of people. I knew it was Adam Osborne and Clive Sinclair, and I met all those players. So, the next thing I know, I'm in London, and there's a meeting of general managers, and unbeknown to me, uh, Chuck Peddle was flying on the same plane with me. And I, I went. I recognized him, so I went over by him and sat next to him and his wife, and we spent the whole flight together. And he told me all the things I needed to know to succeed at Commodore. 
Chuck was having a lot of trouble with Jack. They were they had a love hate relationship. Chuck was the senior engineer, um, and he was famous because when Jack bought MOS Technology, the semiconductor company, to make chips for Commodore yeah, calculators, yeah. after Texas Instruments dried up the market to make their own calculators, Jack had to find a place to make chips. So he bought MOS Technology, and Chuck Pedal was the chief engineer. And when Jack walked in. Chuck said, you did not buy a semiconductor company. And he said, what do you mean? He said, you bought a personal computer company. And he took him into a lab and he showed him. Jack told me the story and Chuck told me the same story. Took him into a lab and showed him um, the Commodore Pat. I think it was wood, maybe made of wood at that time. I'm not sure. And Jack yeah. was so totally impressed. So uh, Jack then sold that and he and he had he took advanced orders to help pay for it because they had to pay they didn't have enough money to, to produce it so they took advanced orders and they they had so many orders at six hundred dollars that jack said i think we priced it too low so he took it to europe first doubled the price to twelve hundred dollars and and sold the first pets in europe because he was very comfortable in Europe, having been born there, of course. And he, everybody knows he was a six-year survivor of Auschwitz. He was on work gangs. Um, yeah. So yeah. anyway, he, they took the pet to Europe. And Chuck Peddle had told me this story on the plane. And and then they delayed. They kept the money of the people who paid in advance for like six months before they delivered the product in the U.S. Everybody started getting mad at them. And that, be, that started the love-hate relationship between the market and Commodore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I get so I get to the meeting and there's this ta square table with about 20 people around it. Kit Spencer, the marketing uh, guru from the UK, Bob Gledo, who was general manager in the UK, Sam Tremell, Jack's son, oldest son, who was doing uh, operations in Hong Kong, and uh, Chuck Pell and uh, Harold Speyer, the general manager from Germany, Tony Tokai. The uh, general manager from job. Japan, Yash Terakura, who did engineering for magic. All, uh, uh, I think John Fagans, maybe. I'm not sure. And anyway, so all these people were there. And um, we started talking, and, and Chuck Peddle showed a prototype of a new computer, a new color computer. He called it the Color Pet. It had other code names. It looked like an Apple II. It was exactly the same form factor. In fact, there are pictures. I have pictures of the Apple, this uh, Apple II clone sitting in front of Chuck Peddle on the table at that meeting. But Jack had said that he wanted a small color computer. So Jack came in and he addressed the group and he said, I don't want that. I want a small introductory computer to seed the market. So I want a, a, a cheap computer. And he knew this existed because a college student named Bob Yenis, an engineering student, had done a prototype as a school project using a chip called the VIC chip, video interface chip, that we, w we wanted to sell to Atari, but Atari and other game companies didn't want it. So Bob Yenis made something out of it, and that became like the prototype for the VIC. And Jack knew this existed, so Jack said, that's what I want. <clears throat> I then took it upon myself to champion that, and I started arguing passionately that in a traditional market, you can't just have a CBM, a Commodore business machine, a Commodore PET for the education market, and nothing at the bottom. You have to ha you can't just throw in an Apple, a, a, an app, sort of an Apple ripoff sort of form factor, you have to have like a little introductory thing, like around $300 and attach it to a TV set and let everybody in schools, use, elementary schools could buy it. And my strat, I said, I'm, I'm hired as a marketing strategist. So here's the strategy. We have to have an introductory computer costs about $300. P children start using it in grade school because schools can afford a $300 computer. They, grad, they go up higher and they get a pet in the high school. Then they graduate, they, they buy a CBM business computer. And they do this because they were introduced to Commodore as children. 
And that's the strategy. And believe it or not, of the 20 people, only three of us wanted this. Me, Kit Spencer, Tony Tokai, Yash Terkura wasn't talking much, but me, uh, Kit, and Tony Tokai argued for this. Well, Jack left. There was like a whole day of presentations and sales presentations and inventory and all kinds of things. And the next day, Jack came back and said, well, what do you say? Well, 16 of the people <laughs> argued for this, uh, this uh, color pet uh, that Chuck had brought as a prototype, including his engineers. And then me and Kit and Tony argued for the small computer, which is what Jack wanted anyway. And Jack said, okay, um, he listened for a while. He, everybody was talking over everybody else. Finally, Jack took his fist. He pounded it on the table. And he said, he literally said this. He actually said this. Gentlemen, the Japanese are coming. So we will become the Japanese. The Japanese had already taken over the television market. They had they had taken the Black Matrix television screen from Sony by patenting it in Japan and claiming it was Japanese technology there, although it was invented first here. And then they came in full force with cheap, uh, a much less expensive TVs. They took over the Walkman uh, tape, uh, tape market, the portable radio market, and we had seen them do this over and over, and we were afraid they would do this with computers. So and when Jack pounded on the table and said those magic words, the whole table fell silent and had to agree with him. Now, I got some credit for being one of the champions. This is my first day with a company, and I'm like championing a new computer. <laughs> so when we got back to, to um, oh, after that, we went to uh, uh, Germany. Jack, we got on a plane. I in those days, you could travel with a driver's license, and I had two forms of identification. I had a driver's license, and I had an ID card as a member of the constituency council of Senator S.I. Hayakawa in California. One day, I saw that they were looking for people to be on this council, so I called them up, and they put me on the council right on the phone. That was so weird. So I was, I was on the council of uh, Senator Hayakawa, and I had an official-looking uh, a card with my picture and a real all kinds of government stuff on it. So we then had to go to Germany, but Germany required passports. So what we got on a private our private jet, we flew to Germany with Harold Speyer. There's a picture of me and Harold actually getting on the plane on the on the jet, and um, we got there and I didn't have a passport, so I showed him my my Senate card and they accepted that as ID. <laughs> they took everything. Um, and a couple times we went to Germany and my passport, when I did have a passport the next time, and my passport never got stamped. Nobody knows I was ever in Germany yeah, because yeah. a lot of our a lot of our arrivals and departures were secret. Mm -hmm. And the reason is we met with some government officials and Jack said, I want to buy a bankrupt electronics company in Braunschweig, Germany. I want some tax breaks. I want some help from the government and I will make computers here. And that one of the German officials said, I was in the meeting, he said, why should we do this for you? And Jack said, number one, because I was in Auschwitz and you owe it to me. He said that with a sneer. And then he said, with a smile. He changed from a sneer to a smile and he said, besides, it'll be good publicity for you. <laughs> and they went and they looked at each other and they nodded and smiled and they said, that makes sense. <laughs> so Jack went to Braunschweig and he announced to 100, 106 employees in the warehouse that he was taking over the company and they would be making computers for Europe, for Commodore. And he said, now, listen, I have to tell you that some of you were in the war. 
And you and I was I was in Auschwitz. I'm a, I'm a Jew who was in Auschwitz. And if you don't want to work for a Jew from Auschwitz, you're welcome to leave. No hard feelings. Six people walked out, but the interesting thing is, 100 people stayed. And Jack, uh, when I asked Jack how he felt about that, he said, "I don't hold a grudge against." the German people, because it wasn't the Germans who killed the Jews, it was the rules that killed the Jews. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, Germans are, as a culture, they follow the rules. And if a maniac is making the rules, they're following crazy rules and killing Jews and, and, and gypsies and handicapped and gays. And that's, that's true. Now, Jack thought that he was over that and that he had put it behind him. And in fact, I asked him one day, I had lunch with him a few weeks later, and I said, how do you deal with the Holocaust memories? It must be horrible. I, I had that kind of a relationship with him. I could talk to him about anything. I'm that way with everybody. I worked for generals in the army. I, I was consultant to CEOs, and I just talked to him like this, you know, and they love it. So I asked Jack one day, how do you deal with the Holocaust? And Jack said, I live in the future. <laughs> I love that. That's, That's my great. favorite. Michael, may I just, I, I, I would like I would to jump in. Go exactly. ahead, jump. My question is this. We heard any kind of story about Jack Tramiel. He was a great entrepreneur, but at the same time, a very hard person, as you have been described at work. There are dozens of anecdotes about him, and probably most of them come from you, so you know better than me. My question is, Michael, who was really Jack Tramiel, Angel or Evil? What do you think of this explosive mix of being very hard professionally on one side, but at the same time, providing computers that without him probably would never have reached such a big number of people at that time. And at the same time, I mean, doing these kind of things that you described, what is the real Jack Tramiel or is it both, you know, phases? Okay. Let me explain it this way. <clears throat> Jack believed his business <coughs> philosophy <clears throat> was like a religion, but it was very unique to him. We tried to codify it once. We, I actually said we should put it down in writing for personnel and for our new employees. And so we wrote it up. And some of the things we said was, if you join the company, you invest yourself in the company. And it's not like just working, it's investing. <clears throat> um, if you last a year, you have lifetime employment. If you can last a year, you have lifetime employment, but most people did not last a year. We had to take that out because personnel told us that's a no-no. <laughs> um, Jack said he had a mantra, treat every penny as your own. The Some anecdotes about Jack, when we came back from Europe, from the London meeting and the Germany meeting, I, I wrote a 30-page single-spaced memo, everything you should do with the new computer. And I threw it, went into Jack's office, threw it on his desk. It was like 30 pages. The name, the price, price should be $299.95, uh, uh, marketing ideas, everything. Um, features, it should have uh, uh, programmable function keys and all kinds of other things. I recommended those things. Jack showed it around the company for about a week and a week later he came into my office and he threw it on my desk oh, wow by the way when i finished the memo i i didn't know what to put on the front so i made a big happy face with a beard and mustache and as a lot of you know that's been my my symbol ever since and that's where that came from so jack threw this back on my desk and i i said what's when i threw it on his desk he said What's that? And I said, that's everything should be done with the new computer. Make sure whoever's in charge does all these things. And then when he threw it back on my desk, I said, what's that? And then he said, 
that's everything should be done with the new computer. Make sure everything gets done. And I said, what do you mean? And I went around and told everybody in the company, anybody who's involved with this computer, they have to show it to you first and get your approval. And he said, this is not going to be easy because none of these people report to you. You're younger than most of them. And you'll have to do this by persuasion. And he looked at me and he said, what do you think? And I said, oh, I can do that. I'm very <laughs> persuasive. And this is where you were nicknamed the, the Vic Czar, correct? Yeah, that's when I became the, the Vic Czar at that moment. And, and he started calling me that. He, he said, yeah. he said, we have, he said, we have an energy. I said, can I have a title? Can I be product manager? He said, no, no, I don't believe in product managers. And I said, so what can I be? And he said, uh, we have an energy czar because we have a gas shortage. You can be the Vic czar. <laughs> well, I was actually the Vic czar. Actually, uh, that was on my business card at one time. And that was funny as hell. But later on, he officially made me the, ho the home computer product manager uh, and also Vic product manager. So I got those titles later. Anyway, so here, here's what – so about a week later, I had some software contracts, and I said, can I make a, a standard software contract? Because we have to renew them. They'd all lapsed. Commodore was so screwed up. I had to renegotiate all the software contracts for all our games and educational software and everything. And I had to do it before anybody found out about the VIC-20 or they would raise the price because we were paying like 50 cents a piece royalties. So I, I took a form software contract to Jack and I said, can we use this? And then just put an addendum on uh, for, for each, each uh, contract. He looked at me and he said, no. And he, I said, why? And he said, I want you should have sex. <laughs> I said, excuse me? And then I said, okay. Now, in the meantime, I had been hiring these, these young programmers who had taught themselves machine language and assembly language and writers, Neil Harris and Andy Finkel and Eric Cotton and Jeff Bruett and Bill H Hinsdorf and several other people that I hired uh, who I called the Vic Commandos because people kept stealing our equipment for trade shows. So I said, we got to get tough. We are now the Vic Commandos. And we became like a commando team. And we got a symbol, big brass coins that we would flip like gangsters. And we started being tough. And I, I announced to the whole, the whole group, I said, you know, Anybody who comes and steals a computer from us, the next one is going to be fired by me. <laughs> and nobody knew if I could do it, but that I didn't care, and th they didn't know. So nobody stole any more computers. So anyway, the Vic Commandos were with me when Jack turned and said, I want you should have sex. And I said, oh, okay. So I turned around and walked away, and my, the the commandos were like little little meerkats in a in a in an African documentary. They were like, "What does he mean? What did he mean? What does that mean? What do you mean have sex? Do you have sex now or what?" So, so I said, "No, no." I just I said, I, I said, every experience is different when you're when you're in, into a romantic situation. So he he just pointed out to me that the mechanics are always the same. But the negotiation and, and everything else is, is unique. So I have to negotiate everything. And that's what he was telling me. But I understood that because Jack talked in shorthand. Another time we were walking down the hall and I was saying something to him. I was all full of myself. And I thought, whoa, I'm, getting, I'm doing pretty good. Making some comment to Jack. And Jack suddenly turned around, glared at me with like what looked like hatred. And he said, you're so green. <laughs> and then he walked away and I said, my God, I was a consultant in Beverly Hills. I had an MBA. I was a captain in the army. I experienced combat. I had a bronze star. And you know what? Jack was right. I was really green in his eyes because of he was really tough. He could make a vice president cry in a meeting. Now, the Vic Commandos, he would, he would like, he would ask a vice president or a director about something. And they would 
say, I have to get my staff or I have to get one of my people. And Jack would say, you don't know it yourself? And he'd say, no, such and such knows. And then somebody would come in, show a lot of operational knowledge, and it would become clear that the manager was just managing. And Jack would say, okay, I'll tell you what, you're fired. You have that job now because you're the one who's actually doing it. We don't have managers who manage here. We only have managers who do things. You have to understand that. And the vice presidents would be in shock. And Jack would say, they'd say, my kid's in high school. I just bought a house. I just moved here, blah, blah, blah. I've only been here a couple months. Jack would say, sorry, you don't fit in here. You have to leave. Uh, uh, we'll give you a nice severance package. Go see personnel. That was his exact words. Go see personnel. And people would walk out like weeping. And my Vic commandos were in some of those meetings. And once they turned, they, they leaned forward to me and they said, we have a question for you, Michael. <clears throat> and I said, what? They said, how are you so calm through all of this? I mean, you never get upset. Even when Jack attacks you and pounds on the desk and swears at you about something you screwed up, you just always calm. And I looked at him and I said, first of all, I'm always sitting next to Jack. And if you know the military concept of enfilade, that means when someone's shooting down a mountain, if you get close enough, you're under the bullets. The bullets go over your head. So <laughs> always stay close to the guy at the top. Stay really close so the bullets go over your head. And the second thing is when he attacks me personally, I said, I'm fine. Anybody can do anything they want to me as long as they're not shooting at me because I've been in that situation. So if you're not shooting at me, I'm just calm as molasses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree on that. Carlo, do you yeah. have something? I know yes, you have. Yes, yes. Yes, I, 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 I'm, uh, first of all, forgive me for my English, but I'm Italian, so you, 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 you. You have so many Italian accents from, Roberto, from my English. I told you most of my friends are Italian, so yeah, your English yeah, is yeah. fine. Okay. <laughs> I, I have some question for um, the historical part, because there is uh, something that I'm um, not so known uh, about uh, Commodore story. And uh, I want to, if, if you can, uh, uh, told us uh, something about this, uh, that Commodore was a truly a multinational company, no? not just because uh, uh, of the roots of the founder, but also the many Commodore entities around the world that uh, contributed to the development of the products and the sales. No? But uh, uh, Commodore has the important, the Commodore of Japan, no? the importance of Japan has been remarkable and uh, I think underestimated about uh, in Commodore history. And uh, uh, the Vic, uh, which the first version was uh, Japanese, no, with uh, yes. katakana characters, and uh, was first uh, commercialized here, no. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tony Tukai, just Terakura, Yashi Terakura. Uh, why was this choice of Japan, and what uh, was the contribution of to the development of the Vic Twenty or the Vic? Uh, 1001 or 1001, uh, that was the name of the Big 20 in, in Japan, and, and why this name in Japan and not the Big 20. So, uh, what's uh, really the, the, the importance of this, this choice and why uh, this choice? Well, when, <clears throat> when I was in London, uh, at, when I was on the plane going to uh, London to the first London meeting, Chuck Peddle said, you should take this opportunity to get to know all the general managers all over the, the world because th this is the only time they've ever been in one place at the same time. And you could be the focal point where whenever they need something done, you're going to be assistant to the president. They could just call you and get stuff done that they cannot get done right now. So I made a point of taking everyone aside and getting to know them on a personal basis. We went to dinner or lunch. We even went to English Parliament one day with Kit Spencer and his wife and w walked around among the green chairs in the Parliament. 
we got special access. We did all kinds of things. To, we went and saw the Bobbies, the, the, the guard, the palace guard. I, I spent a lot of time with Tony Tokai. And we hit it off because I had lived in Asia for two years. And uh, I had done in Korea, business right? In Japan, yes, in Vietnam and Korea. And I had been to Japan about eight times. And I had done business there um, when I was in the army and afterward. Okay. So Tony and I just hit it off so well. He was so, you know, he was very taciturn and serious looking, but he, but he and I just formed a bond, a friendship right away. And Yash Terakura, uh, and it turned out that the, around this time, Chuck Peddle was leaving the company and taking some engineers with him <clears throat> before he left. He didn't want to do the small computer. He wanted to do a a, 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 a desktop, a, a personal computer, not a home yeah. computer. So Chuck yeah. was on his way out. The engineers were not interested. And so some of the work had to be done in Japan. So Tony, uh, uh, Yash Terakura did a lot of the work. John Fagans did a lot of the work in California. Uh, a lot of it, and some of it was done by a few engineers at uh, Bob Yanis and uh, uh, Charlie Winterbull and uh, the, the engineers in in uh, the East Coast. <clears throat> so I went to Japan almost immediately as soon as I was made the Vic Czar. Uh, by the way, Tony accepted that. He accepted me in that role. He thought I was doing a good job at that, which was very surprising because he was a, a veteran with the company. And so they accepted that. So I went around and I told everybody that the the when I'm not there, we have um, a prime directive like Star Trek. They always had a prime directive. And I said, my prime directive is it must be user-friendly. And I waved the user-friendly flag everywhere. In fact, I waved it so hard that the editor of Byte Magazine sent me a letter once. And he said, Michael, do you know that there's a word in German that means user-friendliness? And it's Benutzefreundlichkeit. So we had we had brass plaques made for all the Vic Commandos, and we put them on our walls of our office. What was that? Benutzer Benutzer Freundlichkeit. And so I learned that word from the editor of Byte Maker. That's I was waving that flag in interviews and everywhere I went so much that I became associated with the phrase. So here's the funny story. When I told Yashi Terakura, there's only one rule here, Yash. It must be user friendly. And Yash looked up at me and grinned and he said, Michael son, of course this will be user friendly. I am a friendly engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so you confirm, I mean, the great importance of uh, Japan and Tony Tokai and these engineers in the birth of the Big 20. Well, it's more than that. Tony and uh, Tony, you know, Japan is kind of uh, very odd in terms of their business network. Yes, they have. They had a um, like a five-story small five-story building with little trade show booths all over the building. Yes, that they showed prototypes, and that's where they anyone could come in there, and they would market yes. test new computers. Well, Tony took me there, and one of the computers caught my eye. It was called the PC five thousand. It was uh, it was tan, uh, light tan colored, and with orange programmable function keys. And I what said, was it? I want those. NEC, I want those. huh? What was it NEC? Yes, yes. Okay, NEC yeah. PC, I think it's called the PC 5000. Okay, uh, it was 6000. 6001. Six, this was called the 5000. Okay, okay. This okay. was 1980. Okay. So um, I, I, Tony said, yeah, we can do that. So that's where the function keys came from. So uh, Tony and I are responsible for those function keys because uh, nobody else had them. And if they did have oh. them, they weren't like they weren't programmable. So anyway, um, Tony not only did the first version of the computer, originally I wanted to call this the Commodore Spirit because the yeah, pet is famous, yeah, the yeah. Commodore Pet. So this is now a continuation of the Commodore Pet and the Commodore Business Machine, CBM. This is the Commodore Spirit. 
Well, I was ready to go with the Commodore Spirit, and then um, Tony Tokai at the last minute sent me a telex, and then he called me on the phone and he said, Michael Sun, you cannot say Commodore Spirit. And I said, why? And he said, Commodore Spirit in the US means Casper the Friendly Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> like a cartoon. But in Japan, Spirit, Commodore Spirit means horrible flesh eating ghoul from hell <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. It's a really bad thing. He said, it's not going to be a friendly thing. So I said, okay, so let's call it the Vic 20. And then he agreed with that. And Jack, because vi call it Vic 20 for video interface chip, which was the semiconductor that Bob Yanis invented or helped, helped uh, uh, utilize at MOS Technology. That's what made it. So I mentioned it to Jack. Jack said, I gave a presentation to Jack, and I said, first of all, it's going to be three uh, two hundred and ninety nine ninety five, and he said, why why not three hundred? And he I said because in marketing, if it's two ninety nine ninety five, it it feels closer to two hundred than three hundred. And if you say three hundred, it sounds like a lot of money. And he said, okay, I accept that. And he said, now why are you calling it Vic twenty? Twenty has nothing to do with the screen size or characters or anything. And I said, well. Vic sounds like a truck driver. So we have to put a number next to it. And <laughs> 20 is a really friendly number. $20 bill, 20 this, 20 that. And so I said, we're just Vic 20 because 20 is a friendly number. Just yeah, like yeah. 299 is a friendly price. And Jack said, okay. Just like that. Said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and why, why, one why thousand and one thousand? One thousand in Japan? One thousand. Well, well, Tony said 20 doesn't mean anything here, but two th the 2001, a space odyssey was very popular in Japan. And he said, you know, I think I'd like to call the Japanese version uh, Vic 1001, and we'll play off the 2001 space odyssey. And I said, that's mm. a good idea. So he did that. Mm. So we, int uh, we introduced this, and now there's a lot of confusion now historically about when the Vic was launched. Well, actually, it was launched first in Japan, and yeah. this was a good test market for us. So I went to Japan for the formal launch. Mm -hmm. It was launched at an annual technology fair that was held at Seibu Department Store, S-E-I-B-U, Seibu Department Store yes. in Tokyo. Yeah. And in 1980, September 1980. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had we had about half a dozen Vic thousand and ones hooked up to TV sets running little programs, and <laughs> Japanese engineers from all the other technology companies, Sony, NEC, you name it, they were all swarming our booth with screwdrivers, mm -hmm. trying to unscrew the case to look at the circuit board to find out. How the heck could we possibly make a profit on a $300 computer? But yeah. what they didn't know is that we were vertically integrated. Vertically integrated means you make everything yourself. You don't contract everything out. We made our own chips, and that was the secret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, about the software, about uh, the, we have the famous uh, HAL, uh, HAL Laboratory. Uh, HAL, HAL Laboratory. Oh. And Satoru Iwata, uh, that was the, uh, we will begin the CIO of Nintendo. Yes. And he made the, the, the famous uh, Pac-Man, Jelly Monster, Rally X, Radar Retrace, Galaxian. Why, why they, the name changed from Japan to okay. games and, and uh, from Japan to, to US and Europe? This is a fascinating story. Okay. One day, I think Tony or or Yash walked in and said, Michael, we have Pac-Man. And I said, what? <laughs> we have Pac-Man. Hal Labs did a version of Pac-Man, which is a direct representation of Pac-Man, but it was 10 times better than, than, than Atari. Atari, 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 Atari. Atari. You know, Atari 
had licensed the Pac-Man game from Bally Midway, which uh, which did arcade games. Bally Midway was yes, the arcade yes. company in Chicago. Um, so uh, Hal did a Pac-Man version because it was so popular, but it was as good as the arcade game, but it was 10 times better than Atari, which was highly pixelated and very rough and crude. So we brought it in and I we showed it to Jack and we said, what should we do with it? And Jack said, we'll make it. And I said, what do you mean we'll make it? And he said, we'll produce it. We'll sell it in England for the European market. And I said, what happens when Atari sues us? And he said, no problem. We will accumulate uh, royalties. And when Atari sues us, we'll tell them we're going to pay you these royalties and now we'll stop making it. <laughs> and we'll do that. And and then when we showed it to Kit Spencer, who was a genius, and he was uh, he was my role model at Commodore, who I emulated. Everything I did that I was doing as a Commodorean in the early days was trying to be like Kit Spencer. I looked up to him. He's still a good friend of mine to this day, and we 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 send we do Facebook once in a while messages here and there. And he's he is I I think he was one of the true geniuses at Commodore. I I just love the guy. He was great, so charming, so personal, so generous, so brilliant as a marketeer. And I worked for him uh, for about six months uh, uh, during my time. And we working for him wasn't like working for him. It was like working with him. He would just say, "What are you going to do today?" You know, and I'd tell him, and he'd say, "Great." So we were totally insane. So my best my best business colleagues there were Tony Tokai and Kit Spencer were the closest to me at Commodore. Anyway, so the UK guys renamed the the game Jelly Monsters, and it was exactly the the ripoff. So guess what happened? A little while later, uh, about I guess it was a year later. First of all, we sold over a million of those games. Oh, yeah, way yeah. over a million. And if you sell a million games, you're going to sell 800,000 to a million computers as well. And mm -hmm. that's what, one reason why the VIC, even as a game computer, became the first microcomputer of any kind to sell a million units. Mm -hmm. Probably yeah, the first yeah. computer of any kind. So anyway, um, when Atari sued us, guess what? We just sent him a letter and said, we'll pay you this much in royalties on the units that were sold and agree to stop making it. And they accepted that. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you, you, you paid the royalties to Atari at, at the last. Yes. 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 So but then, the, then we went, mean, to Bally in Midway, Japan, uh, in Japan, we went to Bally in, Midway and we got more games from them. And those guys were kind of, um, uh, very tough, and I was in that meeting as well. Yeah, yeah, I remember Gorf and the, the others uh, uh, officially just licensed by Midway. But uh, uh, there is the um, the question that the name Pac-Man remains on the Japan edition of the cartridge for the Vict. An interesting side story. We did a deal with Bally Midway, and Bally Midway was rumored to be run by organized guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. How to we understand. It. Okay. And um, and when we walked in, they were all wearing like gray shirts and white ties and diamond stick pins. And, and did they have cannoli with them? And that was Bally. And 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 when and and we said we want to license all your games, and they said, well, you can have all our games except Atari uh, Pac Man, which is licensed to Atari. Okay. So by the way, we knew that Bally would not sue us because we had this deal in place with Bally. So yeah. Atari had to accept the royalty. Yeah. So the Bally guys, um, Jack and I said, well, would you like us to send you a contract? Uh, for the <laughs> game? I uh, we were going to pay a certain amount per game. And, um, and they said, no, just send us a letter. And so I, I wrote the letter, and the letter said, <laughs> we're going to pay you this much royalty. We have access to all your games. And if in the future, the production economics or the marketplace changes and we have to lower the royalty, we will come and contact you and we will do that by mutual agreement that we can lower the royalty. And that's all the letter said. That's all it said. Oh. And, and that was it. And when we walked out of that meeting, Jack turned to me and he said, boy, I wish all business meetings could go like that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but I know but later about, on Nintendo, I became yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was asking about this. Yeah, Go ahead you, and ask. you, you, in fact, you have the, the role with the Nintendo contract, but Tremel refused to sign it for Commodore. But uh, uh, I, I, do you think that the Nintendo uh, Famicom, the, the Famicom, the Nintendo, the NES, was a response to this refusal? Well, the actual truth is I am probably myself personally responsible for the Nintendo game machine being developed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not yeah. kidding. Here's what happened. I made friends with the vice president at Nintendo and I negotiated a contract to buy all to license all their games, Donkey Kong, etc. So <clears throat> The Japanese came to uh, Santa Clara to meet with Jack and get the contract signed. So I, I had them in another office. <clears throat> I walked into Jack's office and I said, here's the contract, Jack. Uh, could you sign it, please? Jack looked at me and he said, I changed my mind. We're not going to do it. And I said, why? And he said, I just changed my mind. I'm, I'm ab I found out later that he didn't want to upset Bally Midway. And he thought that might hurt that relationship, and he'd make a commitment to them. And uh, Nintendo was in competition with Bally. So I can understand his feeling, but why did he wait to the last minute? So I, I had the contract <laughs> ready to be signed. It was already signed by the Japanese. So I went back in, and I talk about losing face. Oh, my God, that's the time I lost more face than ever. I think I lost half my beard. It probably just fell out. <laughs> Can't imagine. <laughs> I had to explain this to the Japanese. Oh my God, I was so embarrassed. I was I was chagrined. And so guess what? So then I found out later, the vice president told me, well, if they're going to play those kind of games with us, we're going to make our own game machine. And they did. And I think Yes. That's, that was the direct reason why they wound up making their game machine. And by the way, I have a Nintendo and I love it. I've always played Nintendo game machines at home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the, this was the, the really, uh, this very interesting, interesting because uh, we can uh, describe better the period when we have the Atari crash in the US because uh, Commodore was mainly responsible, I think, about this. And uh, Commodore was also responsible of the, the rise of Nintendo. So <laughs> it came in the middle of the of 1984 crash of video game crash that uh, was uh, Commodore make a computer that uh, broke the video game market. And uh, then we have the Nintendo game machine that was caused by Commodore. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> really, yeah. Not only <laughs> that, really but, thing. but when, when Jack left the company, he found out, I called him one day, I called him after he left the company and he was making himself, I said, what are you doing? And he said, I put down my machine gun long enough to make myself a sandwich. And I said, what do you mean? And he, he had taken over Atari and he was firing like hundreds of people like every day to squeeze the company down to the right size. And oh, Jack, Jack had another thing. He told me once, if you turn your back on a company, it will double in size overnight. So you have to keep firing people. He literally <laughs> said that. So, so he, he, um, he told me that Atari never made money, that they actually lost a billion dollars in five years. So despite their humongous popularity, they never actually made money. And Jack was shocked when he when he got into the company and, and took it over. Okay. Uh, you may be, Roberto, to come yes, back to like question to, back to another important thing that I know you uh, followed, which is the Vic modem, uh -huh. uh, Michael. So how was this born and uh, how important it was for the birth of home telecom in the United States? Ah. Uh. <laughs> so you, a, you have five a, hours only for this, but no. <laughs> let, let me give you a twisted answer. Um, after Commodore was launched, there wasn't a lot for me to do. You know, we had the adventure games, we had more games happening, and then uh, the the Vic Commandos went off to were hired away by another guy in the company, and so 
people started working on the Commodore 64 and the Commodore 64 was part of a strategy that I developed that I call the bear in the wood strategy. Remember, I was still marketing strategist and I had Jack's ear. A lot of people don't know that I was whispering in Jack's ear throughout these years. Um, and so um, I developed something I call the bear in the woods strategy because I'd been in the woods and I'd actually been attacked you know, by a bear at one point who tried to get me through some shrubs but couldn't reach me. <laughs> uh, so um, here's the deal. What do you do when a bear chases you in the woods? You run like hell. But before you do that, you take off your backpack, you throw it down in front of the bear, and then you run or climb a tree or whatever you're going to do. And the bear stops and looks at the nap sack, and then you run down the road. Well, what do you do when the Japanese are coming after you? You take the VIC-20 or the VIC-1001 for $300, you throw it down in front of the Japanese, and they take 18 months at that time to study it, analyze it, check the market, dot all the I's, cross all the T's before they feel secure. And then they're ready to come in with, let's say, um, a 32K computer because we had a 5K, the VIC-20 was like a 5K computer, expandable to 32K. So the Japanese were then going to do a computer that would be 32K. And the deal is, um, while they were working on a 32K computer based on the VIC-20, we started working on a 64K computer. So that became the Commodore 64. So we threw the VIC-20 down, the Japanese stopped. Then when they were ready with the 32K computer, we threw a 64K computer down in front of them for $500. Japanese stopped. They never came into the home computer market. Now they tried with something called MSX because a guy named Nishi, a former IBM guy, persuaded them. 12 Remember, Microsoft guy. Okay. Yeah to a uh, Microsoft guy, to yeah, yeah. Uh, adopt a, a crude common operating system called MSX. Yeah. People, 12 companies, and I, at first I was scared as a marketing guy. I said, oh my God, I have one company and one advertising budget, okay? How the hell am I going to compete with 12 companies all selling the same operating system? Well, it turned out that MSX was horrible. It was crude. It was worse than the Atari Pac-Man. It was just horrible. They just bought a bill of goods because the guy who sold them the bill of goods from Microsoft was Japanese. And they <laughs> went with that. And they, they were blinded. <clears throat> so in interviews at the time and in private meetings, people used to ask me, what do you think of MSX? And I said, I'm sorry, but MSX is MS dead. And I used to call it MS dead. <laughs> also, yes. uh, we had we had we put a 13 foot cord on the VIC 20 and Commodore 64 joysticks so that people sit in the living room can sit on their sofa and play video games on the TV set which is usually across the room. There's another reason for this. At that time, it was becoming known that sitting too close to a computer to a TV screen could hurt your eyes. Your eyes would start to uh, congeal like eggs, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so we had a, a funny saying inside Commodore. We used to say, "Buy an apple, fry your eyes." Because <laughs> you, had, you had to sit close to the apple to use it. <laughs> well, Covert operations, let's say, of the VIC commandos. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Very good. And uh, okay, so you, you you were crucial in the development of the VIC modem of the VIC modem. Oh, as you VIC said. modem. And, go on, go okay. on. Sorry. When the VIC commandos left, and we started working on the Commodore sixty four, I wanted to do something else. I hired six students from Drexel University to man our customer service phones and answer questions. There were tons of technical questions and many of them were just, how do I print something on the screen and stuff like that. Even though I helped write the manual with Neil Harris, we put little cartoon characters in and we made it really friendly. I did a computer column 
in, called the Vic Magician, which was how to do basic programming, but that wasn't enough. And I said, you know, what we need to do is we need to get the users talking to each other in a community. This is before the internet. So they could answer each other's questions and then they won't deluge our telephones and they wouldn't be upset because they couldn't get to our customer service people. So <clears throat> I said, we need a modem because we could put them on CompuServe. CompuServe was a pre-internet user uh, community, telephone yeah, community. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, the source was another one, AOL. So we needed a modem. Oh, also to get stock, Stock quotes and things like that, you could get a Dow Jones service, which would give you stock information, And but you needed a modem. And I had a modem that was given to me free, but the retail price was $600. Mm -hmm. Most modems were cradle modems that you put the telephone into these two little discs, yeah, yeah. And, and it was very expensive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I told Jack, I'm going to work on a modem. So I found a company that made modems for uh, factories. They made infrared-driven modems in where for use in warehouses. So I contracted them to make a modem for us. Well, I said, but it has to cost $30 to manufacture. And they said, why $30? I said, actually, $33, because the, the rule of thumb in manufacturing is you triple the cost to get the final. The way this works is if it costs $33 and you triple it, that's $100, you can sell it for $99.95. It would be the first modem under $100. Now, uh, when you sell it to the retailer, you probably have, if you sell it to a mass market re retailer like Walmart, you might have to take 50% off. That means you make fifty dollars. It has to if it costs thirty three dollars, and we sell it for fifty dollars, we make about seventeen, and then we got packaging and stuff. So it has to be thirty three dollars. So these guys worked on it, and one night at a convention in Las Vegas, I come home at midnight to my room, and there's the end. These guys, uh, two older guys and two two young engineers, are sitting on the floor in front of my room out in the hallway. And I said, what's going on? And they said, Michael, we have to tell you, we cannot hit $33. I'm sorry. It's And they showed us their prototype, which was a box with two discs where you put the handset in. Mm -hmm. And I said, why do you have to do that? Why can't you do it? I, I have at home a direct connect modem that plugs directly into the computer and directly into the phone. And it doesn't have any... Uh, though it's six hundred dollars, but couldn't we put a modem on a cartridge? And they said, like what? So I drew them a picture, and this is what I drew. I drew them a picture that looks like this. It's a game cartridge, but it's got a modem inside, hooks into the computer, but it also connects to the phone, right to, the here, phone. to the telephone. And I said, why don't I, I drew that on a, on a yellow notepad and they went, oh my God, oh my God, you did it. That's it. That's it. And they like little, again, I'll call them meerkats. They all went da -da -da -da, scrambling down the hall. And uh, two days later, they came back with the design, the cost, the price, everything we wanted. And we wound up paying them, I think, a $7 royalty on every modem. And that became the first modem to sell a million units. By the way, I'll tell you another side story. After I was first hired by Jack, and I, Jack said, you're the only person except me who's authorized to give interviews in the United States, and you can talk to anybody you want anywhere. I know you're a j former journalist. So I said, okay, um, I'll do that. And he actually stood up in a meeting at one time. He said, Michael's going to be a temporary sh a director of marketing for the U.S. for a couple of months until we hire a director of marketing because he's a journalist and he understands the company as well as anybody. And I was actually that for a little while. So anyway, so I was giving interviews to all my friends in the computer industry, Compute Magazine, who I was doing articles for and who saved me, gave me money so I could get my job at Commodore. I was doing all kinds of things and I was everywhere. There's tons of interviews with my picture from those days talking about Commodore. So I went to my first computer 
conference convention in San Francisco in the summer of 1980. And by that time, several articles had already appeared with my picture in it. So I walked into this big, gigantic hall, and somebody turned to me and said, there's Michael Tomczyk from Commodore. Look. <laughs> I got swarmed by a hundred people. I'm not kidding. I was, I didn't even make it to the first aisle. I was just swarmed and I had to stand there for an hour patiently answering all these questions from all the users and dealers, retailers. So <clears throat> as soon as I, the crowd dispersed, I took out my dark sunglasses and I took off my name badge, and that's how I spent the rest of the <laughs> We can imagine it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Since, I mean, we've been running now for some time, uh, this interview, and uh, we know you're very busy, and we will get to this in the final, final part of uh, our little discussion. I, w I have a last question on Commodore, and, of course, you can add anything uh, uh, you want. Only I would like first to make a little note which can be interesting for our viewers. And we published some of these things uh, on the Facebook page where Michael is very active and is uh, administering it, which is the Commodore International Historic uh, uh, Facebook page. Society. I'm actually the co-moderator. Yes, and I would yeah. advise everybody which is interested in uh, Commodore history to go have a look because there are really a thousand little gems and pieces of information, which is unbelievable. And so the little thing we added, and we will detail more, is that we found out with some documents that not only the VIC-20 was first introduced in Japan, but also the Commodore 64 non-prototype was first introduced in Japan uh, four days before the famous uh, CES of 1982. Probably, I'm not sure if anyone knew, even at Commodore US, probably they just did it in Japan without telling anyone. <laughs> and by the way, this happened at the same uh, store that you visited for the VIC uh, uh, 1001. Cebu department store. Correct. And they also introduced this four days before the CES in, uh, in the United States. We will detail this more with pictures and things with the big eyes of uh, Tony Tokai that were uh, uh. present everywhere. Anyway, my last question on Commodore, I mean, we, we have to touch this, is the firing of Jack Tramiel. What can you tell us? You know, there are many legends, history, whispers, things uh, by different people. What, what is your uh, recollection of this? Uh, what do you know? What did Jack tell you? What can you tell us? Okay, two things caused the firing of Jack Trammell. One, um, in the summer of 1983, <clears throat> there was a Newsweek or Business Week or Newsweek article that said that Texas Instruments was selling more home computers than we were. They had something called the 99-4A or something, and that was their home computer, and they were selling... And and they said they were they had like more than twenty five percent of the market, and then we had less of the market. But we knew we were beating them. Our engineers back engineered the TI home computer, and we discovered that they could not possibly make a profit on the CPU. They could they were making all their money on accessories, peripherals, and software and books. So Jack heard this, and Jack was like a wildcat manager. He was like from the wildcat era of the oil industry. He was not what we call a professional manager. So his gut instinct said, let's blow them out of the water and make them leave the market. And the way we do that, we make a profit on our computer, a nice profit, we can afford to lower the, the price of our peripherals and software. So at the, at the summer CES show, I believe it was, Jack, we were in a, we were in a, 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 a trade show booth that had gray carpeting 
and it probably cost a hundred thousand dollars. And next to us was Texas Instruments booth that had watches and calculators and computers, two stories high, black and chrome with meeting rooms and lounge rooms and or refreshments. And we were like in a little normal trade show booth. And we felt like serfs next to the castle. And I had a lot of friends at Texas Instruments. We were very clubby in those days. We exchanged information and we we socialized. So I knew the guys there. And I, I seriously felt like I was a serf next to, next to the castle. But we were making tons more money than we. We were the first billion-dollar personal computer company in the world. So what the heck? So Jack saw that, and I mentioned that to Jack. And Jack said, well, I've got a strategy. So he called a press conference, and he said, we are cutting our peripheral and software pro, uh, costs in uh, uh, prices in half. An hour Within an hour, the head of the, the head of the uh, home computer division came running into our booth. He stood about two feet higher than Jack. He was really tall. And he was just furious. He said, what are you doing? There's profits to be made. You're leaving money on the table. Why would you do something like this? How could you do this? You can't do this. And Jack just looked at him and said nothing. Just smiled at him. And the guy turned around and I found out from my friends that he rounded up all the people from the home computer division, flew back. I think this was a Wednesday or a Thursday. And on Friday of that same week, two days later, Texas Instruments uh, announced that they were exiting the home computer business. Now, that sounds like a good thing, right? You're king of the mountain. Well, sometimes when you wind up king of the mountain, it's a lonely place to be and uh, it can be dangerous to be the only one on the mountain. It's better to have a market with com competition. We all know that from economics classes. It's better to have competition than to be one. Okay, so um, what happened that Christmas? Texas Instruments dumped all their home computers on the Christmas market for $86 a piece or $85 a piece. Some were selling for $50 just to clear the shelves. Our computers were selling for $300 and $500. We took a hit the fourth quarter. So Irving Gould, the chairman of Commodore, who was surrounded by a lot of um, non-computer executives who kept whispering in his ear, who had been brought into the company to provide what he called professional management. One was from Max Factor. One was from Yvonne Picon, the fashion company. They were... Uh, uh, um, Later on, Marshall Smith, uh, the next, the first president after Jack, was from Tyson Bornemisa. So there were people from who were not computer people, and they were whispering in Irving's ear, saying, "We need people from Pepsi, like John Scully, to come over and run Commodore." Well, John Scully almost bankrupted Apple, but no, at the <laughs> time he, at the time he was a golden boy, and everybody went, "Oh, John Scully, he's a uh, he's God," but he wasn't. He was. He was less than that. So what happened was Irving was very upset because two, two things happened. One, Texas Instruments dumped their computers in the market, which cut into our sales. Secondly, all of our retailers who bought peripherals and software, their purchase price was now the retail price. They had to sell products they if they bought a product for $150 and that had a retail price of 300 the retail price was now 150 but they paid 150 so they couldn't make any money so all of our retailers demanded what they call stock balancing stock balancing means you have to make up for their losses when we change the price that hurts them and so we had to give them a lot of free product so the fourth quarter was a disaster for us in many ways. Irving Gould was furious with Jack for not coordinating with him on this fateful decision. Jack thought it was great because we drove T Texas Instruments out and it would only take 
a quarter or two quarters to recover. That was one, one black mark against Jack. The second thing was that Jack wanted to bring his three sons into the company as vice presidents to continue the culture of innovation that he created. He wanted Sam to be like VP operations. He wanted Gary to be like maybe VP of finance. He wanted uh, Leonard Trammell, who was graduating college. By the way, Leonard's, uh, uh, Leonard was not involved in the company at all during the time that I was there. So I don't know much about what Leonard was doing, except he was in college in New York. And so Leonard um, was going to be brought into the company, but Leonard had worked on the original pet and had actually contributed to the development of the first pet. A lot of people don't know that. So Leonard is actually a pioneer in his own right, but he was not involved in the VIC-20 uh, or Commodore 64. So, but Jack wanted to bring his sons in and Irving absolutely hated that idea. He did not believe in nepotism. He did not want four Tremels having to do battle with four Tremels. It was bad enough trying to deal with Jack. So that was the second strike and black mark against Jack. The third one had to do with financing and most people don't know about this. Uh, Commodore was running low on cash and they were doing a lot of things and we were getting ready to launch a new product line called the Plus Four. We were getting ready to launch the Commodore 128 and I, the Plus Four was partly my idea. I had told Jack, why can't we build software into the computer and then when we do updates to the software, we can attach a cartridge or a dongle on the outside and that will include the updates. And we can have the software built in and we should have a word processor, a graphics program, a database, uh, and a spreadsheet. And those were the two, those were the four core app apps, killer apps in, in those days. So yeah. we did, we worked, we did the plus four and I was involved in that. I did a lot on the plus four concept behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, the plus four was never really launched um, because we were going to need a lot of money to manufacture all these things. And, and so there were two points of views. Jack wanted to issue stock and Irving wanted to get bank loans. Irving owned about 20% of the company and he did not want to dilute his ownership. Jack didn't care about diluting ownership. He said the stock price will go way up. We'll be fine. So he didn't mind selling stock and the stock was like $60 or something and it had split two or three times since I was there. The first time I was given stock by Jack, he said, I'm giving you a thousand shares. Uh, my, the, first, the, first, um, the first year I was there, I went, I went to see Jack and there were a lot of people in the, uh, in the hallway, Harold Speyer, Tony Tokai, Kit Spencer, all the people that the top guys were standing in the hallway waiting to see Jack. And I said, what's going on? And they said, oh, Michael, congratulations. And I said, like what? He said, you'll see when you see Jack. So I went in to see Jack. And Jack said, Michael, you are now in the family. I said, what do you mean the family? He says, well, there's an inner group of people that I trust to make independent decisions and do things and understand the religion. And you are now officially in the family. And what this means is you get 100% cash bonus every year. Plus, I'm giving you some stock. I'm giving you a, a thousand shares of stock, but it's actually three thousand because we're going to split three for one, and so you're actually getting three thousand shares. Well, my shares actually split again a couple times, and I had a lot more shares at the end. So then the stock was about sixty dollars, but Irving did not want to do stock financing and dilution, and uh, Jack did not want to do bank financing. So there was a big disagreement there, a major. That was the third strike. So when these th issues were discussed between Jack and Irving at the CES show in January 1984, some people say that Jack offered his resignation or tendered his resignation or threatened his resignation. It's not clear. Nobody knows for sure but there's lots of rumors. Jack probably talked about resigning to his family and they, they believe he was already gone mentally. 
uh, from the company, but I don't think so. And so what happened is the, in, uh, right after the CES show in January, there was a board meeting in New York. And a couple of my friends were there. There was an administrative assistant and the lawyer, Lee Schreiber and Irving. And Jack was there at the beginning of the meeting. And whether he resigned or quit, it was my understanding that Irving refused to accept those conditions that Jack wanted. So whether Jack was fired or resigned, I would say he was fired, although publicly they said he resigned. But it was my impression that he was fired because he wouldn't accept those things. And he was Jack was so angry that he was on a plane back to California before the board meeting was over. And the reason I know that is because I was the first person who was notified that Jack was out of the company. And the reason I know this is because one of the secretaries called me immediately as soon as she knew, and she told me what happened. And she said, Jack was fired. Irving agreed to buy half of his stock, and Jack then later dumped the other half of his stock in the market. And that was why Jack, how Jack left the company. Whether you can call it firing or resigning, Technically, he was maneuvered out of the company. Hey, Ginger. <laughs> okay. No okay. Ginger agrees. We, you know, and, you know, and we, we, we spent already a lot of time. I know you have a very busy schedule. So before leaving you, I just have another question. And of course, you can add anything you would like to. And my question is, what are you up to these days, Michael? What is uh, Michael Tomczyk doing these days? I know you're writing books. I know you're a startupper. You are into uh, a new uh, public offering. Uh, I heard, I read that soon we will see you ringing bells uh, at the NASDAQ. So what are you doing these days, uh, Michael? Well, I'm doing three things. Um, I'm constantly writing. I just finished a book on <clears throat> radical and disruptive innovations. The theme of the book is emerging technologies that are giving us the superpowers of gods and, and comic book heroes and enhancing human capabilities. So I finished that book and that is now uh, with the publisher. So I'll provide more information as it comes along. I'm halfway through my autobiography, which includes unpublished rare pictures of uh, lots of celebrities that I met during my career. Uh, Richard Nixon, Jane Fonda, George Jessel, Billy Graham, uh, Donald Sutherland, Mick Jagger. Uh, I have rare pictures that I took of these people, Bob Hope, um, and, and funny stories to go with them. And so I have a really neat autobiography that has a lot of interesting adventures and lots of celebrity pictures. And I'm about 50% done with that. I'm all, I've also been working for a couple of years now on a screenplay with Roberto Dillon based on the home computer wars that tells the story as like a TV oh, movie. Wow. Um, and we are, we are about 70% done with that, but that's been on hold for about six months because we got busy. I contributed two book chapters in the last year, one as a futurist to a book called Aftershock, which is the yeah, 50th yeah. anniversary of Alvin Toffler's Future Shock. And I was one of the futurists invited to write a chapter. Great I, book. I contributed a chapter to Roberto Dillon's new book. Roberto Dillon is, um, uh, has a book that talks about digital transformation caused by the pandemic. And I contributed a chapter to that, which is very exciting when it comes out. Watch for that. Um, the second thing I'm doing is um, you heard the dog barking. That's Ginger, yeah. the, the Cavalier Spaniel. Um, I was walking Ginger a year ago and I happened to meet a neighbor who's from Bangladesh who was starting who was starting a company to provide mobile cash and digital money 
platforms and applications and services to emerging economies in South Asia, like Bangladesh, India, uh, Brazil, Mexico, uh, African countries. And we were going to bring modern like Venmo and PayPal type uh, services to those countries. And I started working with them uh, as a consultant. We started chatting. And the next thing I know, I'm a consultant. And a year later, we are now preparing to launch a NASDAQ company called uh, FinTech Ecosystem Development Corp. We are basically developing a global financial technology ecosystem. And we're what, what we call a SPAC, which means we're going to yes, be yes. acquiring uh, three to five companies in the next six to eight months. And we expect to go public with an IPO next month. And when that happens, we'll be listed on NASDAQ. We already have our symbol. And I will be uh, in New York with uh, Saiful Khan, Dr. Saiful uh, Kandakar, who is my uh, uh, business buddy and, and the founder of the company. And, we, and he will be ringing the bell and I'll be there beside him. That's very exciting. So I'm, beca- I'm now a fintech innovator. Yeah, and let I, us know. Let us know when this happens, please, on the Facebook page, so we will watch you live. Of course, of course. And I must tell you, a year ago when I was walking the dog, I couldn't even explain cogently what blockchain was. And now I'm, I'm <laughs> up, to, up to my ears in it. And now the nice thing is we can help people in emerging economies to uh, modernize their banking system as well as their retail system. And in the COVID era, you can't do a lot of physical handling of money. So this is also beneficial that way too. The last thing I'm doing, I'll just tell you, if you go to the Commodore Historical Society, there are lots of collectors there. So whatever memorabilia I have that I don't need anymore, that I don't want, I've been sort of selling here and there just to, and the, the proceeds uh, go to cover the cost of archiving memos and magazines and things from the 1980s that I have in my collection that I need to archive. So I'm selling a few pictures of me and Shatner. And like, here's- I have here's one, one, I have one. Yeah, yeah. You have one? Here's one of the pictures of me and Shatner. I I can actually claim the distinction of being the first person to show Bill Shatner how to use a a, a, a computer, and he was the that was the first real computer he ever touched. And after this, we gave him a a, a Commodore CBM system, and that's what he used to do word processing to write his books and scripts. So we got Bill Shatner into writing, we got him into computers, and he just sent me an email two weeks ago. I I dedicated my innovation book to him, and that picture, one of these pictures is in that book, and I I sent a note to his secretary and him, and and, uh, he sent an email back, which is very gracious and complimentary, I must say. Well, he's a special guy, as you know. I I spot a a, a pet computer, a Commodore computer in a Star Trek movie. In the house of uh, uh, of uh, Captain Kirk uh, in the future, in this house there is a pet computer. <laughs> that was the one we gave to him, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. We'll, we'll have to check that. Great. Yeah. Well, yeah. very well. I don't know if Carlo, if you have anything, or I would. I, I have thousand questions, but the yeah. time is <laughs> time is running, and we know yeah. we know already. It was not easy, I, I know, from for uh, Michael to find the, the time to do this uh, so close to the IPO of his uh, new endeavor. So I would just like to thank you once again, Michael, for being here with us, first thing, yeah, and also you. for all the joy that uh, you and all your colleagues and co-workers have taken us, I mean, for so many years. So once well, again, thank you, Michael. All of us keep alive the the concept of what is a Commodorean. A Commodorean is someone who keeps pushing the envelope to make the future happen faster. And that's what we're all doing. And so we're all Commodoreans. And it's it's a great pleasure being able to uh, accept your invitation finally to do this. And I'm so glad I was able to uh, share these experiences with you. This is a way of archiving those those years and 
those accomplishments. And the tribute goes to all the people at Commodore who did this and all the people who ever owned a Commodore computer and all of you who are keeping the Commodorean philosophy alive. So thank you very much. Uh, God bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.